Hi guys, welcome back. It's been a while. As you might be able to tell, back here is looking a little bit more full because I have moved out of Edinburgh. Everything is back here. It's been a crazy couple of weeks moving all sorts of things and reorganising everything. And I've also got a fancy new office chair because this desk in front of me is going to be turning into my home workspace um, when I start uni again. So um, I've got myself a nice chair. If it does annoy you guys, if it moves too much, because obviously it is an office chair, then I'll switch back to the stool, but it's a hell of a lot more comfortable than the stool. But today we're going to do a book video. Um, we are actually kind of on time. For once in my life, I am like semi on time with this video. Uh, I have a few books here. I actually have mostly physical copies. I think I've got one non-physical copy book this ugh, couple of months. So that's what we got today. I read most of them whilst I was on holiday in Mallorca and then I kind of dropped off reading just because everything got super busy. But um, I finished The Power a couple of days ago. So I guess we should start with that one. Um, which is the kind of book club book for this couple of months. I basically read one of you guys' reviews before I read the book itself. So I'm just going to look at that now because it started me off thinking about the book before I'd even begun reading it. So when Nina emailed me, the first, one of the first like points she made was, would you consider the power of feminist text? And what defines a feminist text for you? I'd love to hear other people's thoughts. In a very dark and twisted way, it's totally about gender equality. Men and women are equally capable of being absolutely horrible. And it definitely plays gender stereotypes, but... But if you define a feminist text as a text encouraging gender equality, equality in some shape or form, I'm not sure this is it. For those of you guys who haven't read it, I'll just give you a brief summary. It is about girls around the age of about 15, kind of like a coming of age time, um, discover at one point in history that they have this electrical power and they can cause some serious damage, they can cause a lot of harm and they can also waken this up in older women and um, new girl babies are born with this power. So they basically, all of a sudden the tables are turned, women become more um, physically powerful, physically kind of capable of causing violence and harm. So yeah, I'm kind of, I kind of have the same problem with it, I guess, as Nina. I believe if there was true gender equality, women would be just as violent as men because um, the only reason we're not is a social conditioning thing. So yeah, I'm not really sure what to make of it on that front. In some ways, I think um, having, raising those questions about what a feminist text is makes a book interesting in that capacity anyway, regardless of whether it is or not. I don't think um, there was enough nuance in this book to address that question or the, the kind of feminism of the book in a way that was like intellectually sound. So I thought when I was reading it that it really felt like a young adult novel, which is, there's nothing wrong with that at all, but it's not being treated like one in general. So I was expecting something very different going into it reading it, but I don't think it is a very nuanced, subtle novel where you're going to see like a really in-depth intellectual look at gender and what it would what would actually happen should women discover they'd have this power it's kind of more plot based um and naomi alderman definitely knows where she wants to go with it i don't know yeah i don't know i have the same it, it definitely got me thinking before i'd even started reading the book so molly said that um she also found it to be a quick page turning read more plot driven um than other books in this genre and that the extended metaphor of electricity and lightning was the perfect way to paint the image of power and I do really like that image um, that Alderman has going on in the novel. She said that there are a few different storylines going on throughout the book with, with characters from all across the world and Molly actually liked the framing of the novel so she said on the other hand the last interaction between fictional Naomi and Neil was important especially the satire of the final line, showing how a hierarchical reversal seems so absurd to a reader in a socio-political climate of today. Um, the main bulk of the novel is um, framed to be written by a man 5,000 years from um, when girls first discover this power. 
So the roles are reversed and the framing is that the man who writes the main bulk of the novel messages or emails Naomi Alderman. So it becomes like almost truth, um, asking for her thoughts on the novel. I mean, there are some problems I have with that anyway, because um, in 5,000 years time, we wouldn't be speaking like English like we do now. We also wouldn't have like, I don't know, with the concept of lit literature even exists. I personally found it a little bit strange. Like I do understand what Molly's saying, that the satire is kind of important there. I don't know, I feel like it could have, I feel like that was, it's very forced, it, it's almost like too overdone, it's overwrought a little bit. Giovanna also said that she found the content of the letter correspondence at the beginning, at the end of the book, very predictable. So, and then she can, and she concluded that I feel like the idea of a world dominated by women was good in theory, that how the author changed the dynamic of the world was predictable. So yeah, I found some of the dialogue to be a little bit hammy. Um, and a little bit kind of, I don't know, I think Naomi Alderman is British but the way she writes her Cockney um, British character in Roxy is just like completely overdone. Um, one thing I found, I did find interesting art is, um, because I kind of, <laughs> my dissertation was kind of based on this, um, is whether violence and power are inextricably linked, um, whether in order to have power you have to have violence or you have to have the threat of violence or you have to have some physical upper hand um, whether that is like absolutely necessary for power so yeah I think my my conclusion on this is that the concept was more interesting than its execution I thought it was good it was an interesting read you can fly through it um, and it kept me like it's a page turner it just got holes um, but that's okay it just wasn't the book I was expecting I think so the book for the end of October, will it be? Yeah. Um, I have chosen Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie's Americana. I chose this, I struggled this month to choose a book um, because I'm trying not to buy too many more books because I've got loads on my shelf that I haven't read. Um, but maybe I'll have to do that for next time. But everything that I've got on there just didn't seem quite appropriate. And I seem to remember when I uploaded my book haul and included this in my book haul, lots of you guys had already read it, um, slash wanted to read it, so I thought this might be a good choice um, for the next couple of months. It seems a little bit longer than maybe any of the books I've picked before, but if you do want to read it, I would love it. I'll put all the details down below if you want to email me before I make my video then yeah, I'll pop all the details down below as always, but this is us the next couple of months. I'm excited to read it. So next book we're gonna talk about is James Kelman's Dirt Rose. I believe I talked about um, how late it was, how late in the last video. So this is James Kelman's most recent book, I think. I think it was 2016, I wanna say, yeah. Um, he is a Scottish author um, who I read for my Scottish course. And yeah, this is his most recent book. It's about a, it's written from the point of view of a 16 year old boy. I think it's uh, Kellerman's kind of, Kellerman's kind of funny third per first to third person thing where you're very much in Murdo's mind but it is actually third person so it's narrated kind of inside and outside. It's about, yeah, a 16 year old boy um, who goes with his dad to the American South to visit some family members that they have there. He's lost his mother and his sister to cancer I think various forms of cancer and so it's kind of about the relationship between the father and the son and what how that kind of travels and um, one thing Kelman I think is amazing at is he really um, gives you a slice of like real life you can see in your mind's eye people's reactions the way people are acting um, by reading him I think he's really really amazing at that I think it was a bit of a strange one this novel like I kind of liked it the whole time I was reading it and kind of really didn't like it at all and thought it was quite strange. Like I'm not sure Kelman's style really marries to the idea of a 16 year old boy in coming of age very well. Like the plot is a little bit basic, the ending is completely ridiculous. For the sense of realism that the novel gives you to have the ending that it does I just think is mad. Um, I would be interested to see what someone from Louisiana 
or the American South would think reading this novel because obviously seeing as it's written from Murdo's point of view it is supposed to be like semi naive. Basically he plays the accordion at home and then he kind of falls in love with Zedeco, is it music? Um, I don't know if I'm saying that right. Uh, which is accordion based as well. So there's like this connection cross cultures. Yeah, I would be interested to see what someone from Louisiana actually thinks of this and whether it's possibly too naive um, and the way he approaches the culture is just a little bit too kind of maybe cliche. And the father-son relationship thing, I don't think it was um, explored as well as I thought it would be. So yeah, I just thought this was a total weird one. Like I love Kelman, but I just think this book is weird. So, the next book I don't have physically because I read it on my Kindle, which is Love in the Time of Cholera, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, um, 100 Years of Solitude, one of my favourite books. This is one of my most hated books. I hated this book so much. Um, I really, really hate this book. I, and I went on, I think I went on Goodreads when I just finished it and a lot of people said the same thing, that 100 Years of Solitude was amazing and this is just not amazing. Like, Marquez's style is um, really unique. In this instance, I think it was too verbose. So, in 100 Years of Solitude, you're covering 100 years and, or 100 years, and um, lots of characters, lots to get your teeth into and to um, and for Marquez to use that kind of style. But in this novel there's like three main characters, so it's too much focus with too many words on these three characters. Um, it took me a long time to get warmed up to it, and tricky to get into it because it doesn't really, like the action doesn't start until I want to say like 60% through the book and even then the action isn't really action. Um, oh I haven't told you guys what it's about. It's about a elderly couple in Latin America um, and, and the husband dies um, in a ridiculous accident and basically the woman's childhood sweetheart, um, her first love, comes to her and confesses his love again and says can we start all over again at whatever age they're at which is like at least 70 plus. I'm not sure exactly what it is. Um, so he basically waited his whole life for her husband to die. You guys might already see the problems there because he is manipulative, he's kind of not likeable at all, um, he pushes his way back into her life despite her mo like telling him multiple times, no I don't want you, um, there's certainly no consent in this novel and about kind of like uh, 60 pages from the end, um, there's some really grim um, paedophilia stuff which is passed off as love which I just can't forgive. And there's also just too much focus on the men of the novel considering the woman is what the whole novel revolves around, we get much less of her. So was not a fan of Love in the Time of Cholera, would not recommend, especially if you do not want to ruin Marquez for yourself, just read 100 Years of Solitude and leave it there. The next book I have to talk about is Kurt Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse-Five. Um, <clears throat> this is, I thought it was a kind of unique way of doing a war novel. Um, I know the other kind of famous one that it's compared to is Catch-22. So I am planning on reading Catch-22 at some point. It's about World War II and it follows a character called Billy Pilgrim who um, basically jumps through time. It's like semi-sci-fi. So essentially Billy finds himself at different parts of his life whenever. It could happen at any time. So he could be in the middle of the war, he can be post-war. Um, I don't know if there was pre-war. I read this a little, quite a few weeks ago now. Um, but because we don't follow his story chronologically and it's not written, and it's written with this kind of sci-fi edge. It stops it from being like trauma porn, it stops it from um, catching you too much in the feelings, you know, that kind of war novel which kind of romanticises it a little bit. So yeah, and it can be funny which also makes it more sad I think. So obviously it's looking at the ways you deal with, the ways that people deal with trauma, you know, you obviously um, come to the conclusion that maybe this isn't sci-fi and it's the way that Billy is dealing with his trauma. Um, it's a framed narrative, so 
Um, like in The Power, you get like a kind of fictional Kurt at the beginning, or is it fictional? You don't really know. Um, but in this case, it actually works, and um, you get a sense of the semi biographical nature of the novel because obviously this was written from his um, experiences in the war. It lacks a climax, um, but I think that's okay. Um, but I think you have to kind of like this style. So lots of people won't like this style of novel um, and will find it just kind of pointless and meaningless and irritating. I personally liked it. <laughs> Next up we have a novel, another novel I really hated with all my heart and soul. This is Margaret Atwood's Hag Seed. I believe it is her most recent novel. Um, it is like a retelling of The Tempest. I believe it William Shakespeare's The Tempest. Um, I believe it is part of a series by Hogarth Shakespeare of um, authors rewriting Shakespeare. Um, this was just terrible. <laughs> I hope someone else has read it so we can cry about it in the comments. Oh, uh, I don't even know where to begin with it. I think I tried to wipe it from my brain as soon as I... I have got some notes on it, but I think I tried to wipe it from my brain. Um, so basically, it's a plot within a plot as well, classic Shakespearean thing. So, um... It's about a theatre director who essentially is the role of Prospero, putting the Tempest on in a prison with prisoners as a form of like rehabilitation, like one of those kind of things. Oh, which you just hope and hope and hope she's not going to fall into the trap of just completely making cliched prison characters, but oh my gosh, she does. And I don't know whether she's trying to make it like Shakespearean almost and make them type casts but it just comes across so badly I just uh. um the first thing the first note I wrote on my phone was does Atwood really understand theatre which I don't think she does is that really mean of me to say I don't know <laughs> like it's like the way it's like scorned theatre director is painted and the way the theatre in general is painted is just absolutely mad um you don't really need to have read The Tempest, but it kind of um, helps if you have. I studied it in year seven, so a long, long time ago now, but um, for those of you guys who don't know, that was when I was 11. Like, you could have done so much stuff with The Tempest as your as your source material. Um, so much. And it, she just she just came up with this. It's terrible. The writing's terrible. It's, it's like she didn't even try and she just typed this out in a day. I don't know. I just, I can't, I hate this book. I'm going to put it down now and never look at it again. The next book I read was The Reluctant Fundamentalist um, by Mohsin Hamid. This novel is addressed to you, the reader, immediately um, as it opens. It's, but reading the blurb might help me explain it a little bit better. At a Lahore cafe one evening you meet a mysterious stranger. He asks you to join him for tea and speaking impeccable English he begins to tell you his story. So he's addressing you, but you are an American who is in Lahore. Um, and it is the tale of how, as a young man, he went to America, embraced the Western dream, and even took a Western lover. So the style of that can be a little bit grating, because he'll sometimes be like, oh, I see that you have dropped your spoon. And it's just like, mm. it's focused so much on his experiences in the West, and you're not really sure what happens at the end. Like, does he become a reluctant fundamentalist or not? Um, what's going on at the end, who are you, um, who he's addressing, and what role are you playing. In those ways it feels very much like a novella or like an extended short story and not so much like a fleshed out novel, like it's kind of like a thought experiment as opposed to something that's really looking at deeply at the, like, the way someone might become um, a fundamentalist who maybe was educated in America. I don't know, I felt it kind of unfinished, but then I think that might be the point. Um, and you're not really sure what's going on at the end as well, which I think, again, is kind of the point, but it might irritate some of you guys. Next, we have Dave Eggers' The Circle, which is about um, May Holland, who goes to work for like a Silicon Valley, Google-type company, which essentially is beginning to take over the world, take over all your social media, um, the way you pay for everything, um, surveillance, this, that and the other, like loads of projects that start off kind of good and end up like really sinister. 
If you are interested in the ways that a company might do that, like monopolise basically everything that we do, um, I think this is a really good read. I thought it was um, covered a lot of bases. Uh, it was very thorough in the way it kind of looked at this company and the way the company might do those kinds of things. It was good, it was readable, super easy to read, interesting ideas, and absolutely terrifying because I can definitely see something like this happening in the future, so it's kind of like a dystopia which is a little bit too close to home. There was not too much that annoyed me about it actually, for once. Um, I don't think it's like a masterpiece, but I think it's a really interesting read. Um, it, I think that's because I accepted it kind of as satire, so sometimes the main character, like the main character, um, very quickly becomes enmeshed in this company even though she's only just started there and she becomes transparent which essentially means that like everyone watches her every move and she has a camera and they see everything that she does um, and as a vlogger that kind of freaked me out a little bit but um, yeah it, that kind of very fast quick character development might annoy some people but I think because it was a satire I kind of allowed that to happen. So yeah, I think this is a really interesting read, especially for people of our generation who, who are so kind of attached to our social media and Google and stuff like that, and um, yeah. Um, so finally, we have Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man. This is a classic, as you can see. I think it was 1950s. So Ralph Ellison in this novel is exploring... Um, the opening to this is like one of my favourite openings to a book ever. Basically he's exploring the ways in which um, the narrator as a black man is an invisible man basically and um, the only subjectivity he can get is from what other people think of him and the ways in which he went from being like just a normal person to becoming this invisible man and all the different kind of things that he goes through throughout the novel which can be surreal and they're exploring the politics of being black especially in the 1950s but I found that a lot of it was relevant to discussions that people are having today so it's very rich language, very metaphorical it's kind of satirical and ironic at the same time um, it's very interesting, the conceit at the heart of the novel is very important um, this concept of being an invisible man although I do think it kind of it's there at the beginning and then it kind of comes in at the end and it's I feel like I wanted it more throughout the book but then at the same time throughout the book he's not realised yet that he is an invisible man so I can't kind of see why it's not there throughout. It's like really interesting on the concepts of intersectionality but can be a little bit like tough to push through it but I think it's a super important novel. Yeah I won't say too much more about it because so much goes on in this book um, but I really liked it and I think you guys should read it.